In 1991, an escalating series of political events sent seismic shockwaves throughout the geopolitical landmass that is now referred to as the former Soviet Union. In March, Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia declared their independence. Moscow responded with a violent military crackdown, hoping that this would also squash the growing separatist sentiment in Ukraine, the industrial and agricultural powerhouse of the Soviet Union. In July, after signing the historic START agreements between the United States and the Soviet Union, President George Bush paid a diplomatic visit to Ukraine, indicating its increasingly crucial role in Soviet and global politics. Americans will not support those who seek independence in order to replace a far-off tyranny with a local despotism. They will not aid those who promote a suicidal nationalism based upon ethnic hatred. In his misguided address to the Ukrainian parliament, dubbed the Chicken Kiev speech by Western political analysts, President Bush chose not to acknowledge the fact that Western-style democracy was firmly taking root in Ukraine and that, unlike in other republics, there was no evidence of ethnic tension. We will maintain the strongest possible relationship with Instead, the Bush urged the Ukrainians to sign Soviet President Mikhail Gorbachev's Federation Treaty. As Bush spoke, pro-independence demonstrators gathered outside the parliament building to voice their opposition to the treaty. Although Gorbachev's Federation Treaty transferred a lot of authority from Moscow to the republics, the reduction in the center's power was not drastic enough for the Ukrainians. But to conservative communists in Moscow, it was alarming. On August 19th, the State Emergency Committee, composed of Communist Party hardliners, claimed control of the Soviet Union and its vast nuclear arsenal in an apparent coup d'etat against Gorbachev. As armored personnel carriers poured into the streets of Moscow, so did thousands of Soviet citizens. The overwhelming resistance to the coup was proof positive that the greatest success of perestroika has been the disappearance of mass fear. Boris Yeltsin, the first democratically elected president of the Russian Federation, rallied the people, as well as the soldiers, to defend their hard-won democratic rights. And they did. Three days later, the coup fell apart, making Yeltsin the new power in Moscow. Ukraine responded to the collapse of the coup and the subsequent dissolution of the now discredited Communist Party by declaring its independence on August 24th. The concept of Russia existing without this agricultural and industrial dynamo alarmed Boris Yeltsin. Immediately he sent an envoy to Kyiv, the capital of Ukraine, to forge some sort of Ukraine-Russia alliance. In this instance, Yeltsin, a self-proclaimed Democrat, recalled the words of Lenin, for Russia to lose Ukraine would be like losing its head. Ukraine makes up less than 3% of the former Soviet Union but it is home to nearly one-fifth of its population. 52 million people live and work in Ukraine, the most European of all the former republics. Western influence is eagerly absorbed through Ukraine's borders with Poland, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, and Romania. The third longest river in Europe, the Dnipro, courses through Ukraine, dividing it into east and west. Except for the Carpathian and Crimean mountains, Ukrainian topography consists primarily of vast plains called the steppe, where you will find Chornozem, Ukraine's black gold. This highly productive black soil makes Ukraine a major producer of grain, fruits, and vegetables, accounting for approximately 35% of total Soviet agricultural output. If its technology and harvesting techniques were modernized, Ukraine could realize its potential of not only feeding its own people, but also becoming a major food exporter. Ukraine ranks fifth in world production of wheat, barley, millet, and other grains. With the plummeting value of the ruble, grain has become the new currency, which should be a boost to Ukraine's economy. But the fact remains that annually, nearly a third of the harvest is lost. Some rots in the fields because of bad harvesting techniques, outmoded equipment, and inefficient storage. Transportation and distribution bottlenecks further aggravate the problem by preventing food from finding its way to city markets, resulting in bare shelves at state-run stores. The Soviet food crisis is not the result of a bad harvest, but rather the collapse of the food distribution system coupled with hyperinflation in the private markets. 
In Kiev's Bessarabian market, where much of the produce comes from small private plots, the stalls are full of fruits, vegetables, even meat. But by Soviet standards, the prices are astronomical. Inflation here runs at five to 800 percent, a classic case of supply and demand. Small private markets have mushroomed all over the country as individual farmers try their hand at private enterprise. In the coming years, the huge collective state farms will be privatized. Ukraine's leaders hope that the lessons and economics learned in small private markets such as these will help ease what is bound to be a painful transition to a free market economy. In addition to being the breadbasket of the Soviet Union, Ukraine has also been its industrial engine. It produces 34 percent of Soviet coal, steel and iron and has substantial world reserves of other vital ores and minerals. The bulk of heavy industry, including iron, steel, chemical and heavy machine construction, is located in the Krivirikh and the Donetsk Basin in the southeast regions. The loss of Ukraine's agricultural and industrial output are two reasons why the concept of Ukrainian independence has always been appalling to Moscow leaders. Now there is a third. 176 ICBMs, two bomber bases and a large number of transportable tactical nuclear weapons make Ukraine not only the newest nuclear superpower but also the first to start dismantling its vast nuclear arsenal. In its Declaration of Sovereignty of 1990, Ukraine avowedly declared itself a nuclear-free state. The reason for this vehement commitment to total nuclear disarmament can be summed up in one word. Chernobyl. In April 1986, Ukraine became the first country to be irradiated in peacetime when a power surge blew the roof off the Chernobyl nuclear power plant and triggered a partial meltdown of the core's fuel. Gorbachev's glasnost did not apply to Chernobyl. Within hours of the accident, Communist Party officials and their families were evacuated. In Kyiv, just 60 miles south, a parade went on as scheduled several days later, as deadly radioactive dust fell on millions of unsuspecting people. It took 10 days for mass evacuations to start. Pripyat became a radioactive ghost town. Large sections of Belarus and Ukraine will remain contaminated and uninhabitable for the next several centuries. Chernobyl was the pivotal event that turned the tide for the Ukrainian independence movement. Outrage over the mishandling of the nuclear catastrophe cut across political and social barriers and galvanized Ukrainians of all ethnic backgrounds to wrest control of their destiny from the gross incompetence of the Moscow-centric Soviet system. The Ukrainian parliament has decreed the complete shutdown of Chernobyl, which will begin in 1993. The other five nuclear facilities are also being investigated in preparation for their eventual shutdown. Ukrainians want to rid themselves of these ticking time bombs which are capable of wiping out a civilization that has survived for more than a millennium. Ukrainians are descendants of the Slavic tribes that settled Eastern and Central Europe in 988 AD. The Prince of Kiev, Volodymyr the Great, converted the country to Byzantine Christianity. This transformed the semi-barbaric military country into a civilized medieval state and leading power in Eastern Europe. The Volodymyr's imperial colors were blue and gold. The trident of Neptune, minted on the coin of the state, was his coat of arms. These two symbols continue to represent the national identity of the Ukrainian people. A bronze statue of Prince Volodymyr was erected in 1853. He holds a cross and looks towards the Dnipro River where Kiev inhabitants were baptized nearly 10 centuries ago. Volodymyr's son, Yaroslav the Wise, not only followed in his father's footsteps, but expanded the Kievan Rus Empire for thousands of miles to the north and northeast. Yaroslav was a brilliant military strategist. In 1037, as a mark of gratitude for his victories, he built the Cathedral of St. Sophia, Holy Wisdom. Although it has undergone many changes through the centuries, St. Sophia continues to be the most splendid surviving monument of Kievan Rus architecture. The sumptuous interior contains columns of porphyry, marble, and alabaster, covered with a kaleidoscope of frescoes and mosaics. 
Saint Sophia became the center of learning of Kievan Rus. The first library was founded here. Yaroslav required that all his children learn to read and write, a revolutionary concept for its time. Historians get a contemporary's view of life in medieval Kiev from the Chronicles of Nestor, who recorded events in Yaroslav's kingdom. Nestor described the marriage of Yaroslav's daughter, Anne, to King Henry I of France. Princess Anne signed her full name and title on the marriage contract. The best Henry could do was sign with an X. A fresco of Yaroslav's children adorns the south wall of the nave, but the focal point of Saint Sophia is the Oranta, the praying mother, located in the central apse. It is the most ancient of Ukrainian icons. The citadel of ancient Kyiv was surrounded by a 60-foot wide fortification wall. The main entrance was through the impenetrable Golden Gate. It got its name from the bronze plates that had been embedded in the masonry. The effect made the gate glisten in the sun like gold. The Golden Gate, minus the plates, was reconstructed in 1982 for Kyiv's 1500th anniversary. The new structure is built over the ruins of the original gate. Excavation work has shown that the fortification was particularly durable and constructed with remarkable engineering skill. The period that followed Yaroslav's death was marked by constant invasions and bitter internecine feuds. With time, remote regions of Kievan Rus developed such major linguistic, cultural, and social differences that they became three separate peoples. Russians and Bielorussians in the northeast, Ukrainians in the southwest. New power centers emerged. In the northeast, the rule of the prince turned czar started a centuries-long evolution of centralized power based in Moscow. In 1240, the Tartars delivered the final blow to the disintegrating Kievan Rus state by capturing and sacking the city itself. With the fall of Kiev, the principalities of Volyn and Halic grew in power. The city of Lviv, located at the crossroads of many trading routes, quickly replaced Kiev as an emporium of east-west trade. When Ivan Fedorov was booted out of Moscow for trying to set up a printing press, a thing the Russians called Satan's work, he found not only refuge but support in Lviv. Prince Ostrovsky, one of the few powerful Ukrainian noblemen who refused to assimilate with the ruling Polish class, established a printing press on his Lviv estate. With the Apostolate, the first book printed on Slavic territory in 1574, established Lviv as the center of book publishing. As graduates of Lviv's many educational academies traveled through the countryside in search of work as itinerant teachers, they carried with them an infectious new pride. The seeds of national self-awareness sown in the 16th century would come to develop very deep roots. Throughout its history, Lviv was ruled by the Mongolian Khan, Lithuanian and Polish kings, and the Austro-Hungarian Emperor. After World War I, it was annexed by Poland. After World War II, Western Ukraine merged with the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic. The fact that Lviv has also been known as Leopolis, Lemberg, Lvov, and Lvov testifies to the turbulence of its history. Its multinational influence is evidenced by a cornucopia of architectural styles. The old market square, the Rinok, is an architectural sampler of the centuries. Of its 44 houses, none is less than 200 years old, and each is a designated historical landmark. In its day, the Rinok was the Beverly Hills of Lviv. The ambassador of Venice owned a home here, as did Korniakt, the wealthy Greek merchant whose palace was built in the style of an Italian villa. Lviv's fortification wall contains the infamous town arsenal. In the 15th century, Ukrainian peasants suffered under the harsh rule of the Polish nobility. The Cossacks, who dared to rise up against their Polish overlords, languished in the arsenal's dungeons. The Cossack mystique is similar to that of the cowboy of the American Wild West. There were Cossacks of Don, Kuban, and Ural, 
The Tsar's brutal imperial guard who carried out the pogroms also called themselves Cossacks. But it is the 16th century Zaporizhians that have come to symbolize a national and independent Ukraine. Zaporo literally means beyond the rapids. The Zaporizhian Cossacks built an impenetrable fortress beyond the raging waters of the Dnipro River in the no man's land of the steppe. Geographic isolation offered them the unique opportunity of creating a stronghold out of reach of the Russian Tsar, Polish King, Ottoman Turks, Tartars, and Golden Horde. Unsurpassed horsemen and swordsmen, these brave and brutal warriors lived in a strict military brotherhood and elected their leaders by general assembly. One man, one vote. The Kozak state marked the end of Ukraine's first journey to independence. The Zaporizhian Kozak has come to represent not only Ukraine's democratic heritage, but also the spirit of a free and proud people with the ability to defend themselves and their land. It is that image that today's Ukrainians want to resurrect. Young men dressed as Zaporizhians are always led to the head of political rallies and cultural events. The Zaporizhian fortress is being reconstructed near its original site. Membership in the Kozak reenactment societies is swelling. In 1654, the Cossacks made a fatal mistake by signing the Treaty of Pereyaslav with the Russian Tsar. Instead of being an ally in the Cossacks' war against the Poles, the Tsar interpreted the treaty as his right to subjugate them and their land. It was the end of the first independent Ukrainian state. The Russian Tsar took all lands east of the Dnipro River. All lands west were absorbed by the Polish king. A Ukraine Divided was the subject of many epic works of Taras Shevchenko, the Shakespeare of Ukrainian literature. His are, without doubt, the most famous of all Ukrainian whiskers. Born a serf in 1814, Shevchenko used his talents as a portraitist to buy his own freedom, but his true genius was in the written word. Shevchenko's fiery epics condemned the tyranny of the czars and kings who had ensurfed the Ukrainian nation. Although he died before the Russian Revolution of 1917, the Bolsheviks hailed this anti-Tsarist poet as a revolutionary democrat. In Kyiv, the State University and Opera House are named after him. Monuments to Shevchenko proliferate throughout the country. Therein lies the irony, because Shevchenko is actually the father of Ukrainian nationalism. His emotional words ignited the Ukrainian people to embark on their second journey to independence. That journey ended when the Russian Tsar was toppled. The Russian Revolution offered Ukrainians their first opportunity to form a national government in Kyiv. Within months, the Austro-Hungarian Empire also collapsed, freeing western Ukraine. On January 22, 1919, east and west merged into one state, the Ukrainian National Republic. A small volunteer army proudly marched under the blue and yellow flag of the new republic. A new Ukrainian autocephalous Orthodox Church was created to be independent of the Moscow Patriarch. Lenin and his Bolsheviks, with a much larger Russian army, formed the rival communist government in the city of Kharkiv. For four years, the fledgling republic fought not only Lenin's Red Army, but also the White Armies and the Poles. Before long, Western Ukraine was carved up between Poland, Czechoslovakia, and Romania. The communists overran eastern Ukraine. The Ukrainian National Republic was smashed. Its leaders were arrested, exiled, or executed. The autocephalous Orthodox Church was destroyed. In 1922, Ukraine became a founding member of the Union of the Soviet Socialist Republics. Joseph Stalin was determined to snuff out any semblance of national consciousness. The trident, blue and yellow flag, and the national anthem were banned. In an act of totalitarian absurdity, the letter G in the Ukrainian alphabet was denounced as nationalistic and was banned. The farmers, who formed the bedrock of the national movement, resisted Stalin's collectivization drive of their lands. Stalin responded with force. Thousands of his henchmen were sent in. They took the land, they took the grain, they took the cattle. The forced famine that resulted in 1933 marks the darkest spot in Ukraine's 
pre Chernobyl history. To the outside world, Stalin vehemently denied the existence of the famine, and yet he shut down Ukraine's borders. Food and foreigners, particularly objective journalists, were not allowed in. Ukrainians were not allowed out. While famine raged across its heartland, Ukraine's record harvest was being sold on the global market for the hard currency needed to pay for the industrialization of Russia. The famine claimed seven million victims. One and a half to two million more died of the rampant diseases caused by the decaying corpses. The luckier ones were given Christian burials and mass graves. The years that followed the famine were marked by Stalin's reign of terror, political purges, the mass deportations to the hard labor camps in Siberia and Central Asia. An entire generation of Ukrainian intellectuals was wiped out. In total, one and a half million Ukrainians perished. The Ukrainian language, culture, and history were suppressed. Millions of ethnic Russians were resettled in Ukraine to dilute its national character. When the Nazis attacked the Soviet Union in 1941, the organization of Ukrainian nationalists, an underground pro-independence movement that enjoyed popular support, proclaimed the restoration of the Ukrainian state in western Ukraine. The Nazis immediately arrested the nationalist leaders. Ukrainians organized an effective resistance against the three-year Nazi occupation in the form of the Ukrainian insurgent army, a large network of partisan guerrilla units. At war's end, Ukraine's villages, cities, and the industries lay in ruin. Countless historical, architectural, and art treasures were destroyed. But worse than this, was the decimation of its people. Six million Ukrainians perished during the war, four million of them civilians. Nearly one million of those were Ukrainian Jews. In 1944, Western Ukraine was reoccupied by the Red Army. The guerrilla warfare of the nationalists in Western Ukraine continued against the Soviets. Because the nationalists were predominantly Catholic, a religious minority in Ukraine, Stalin banned the Catholic Church and seized all church property. Looting was not only permitted, but encouraged. Centuries-old churches were desecrated. Thousands were destroyed. Many of those left standing were converted to sports halls, museums, warehouses, or turned over to the Russian Orthodox, the only church allowed to exist within the Soviet state. Catholic priests and bishops who refused to renounce their church were arrested or executed. Many were sent to Siberian hard labor camps along with the nationalists. The Catholic Church went underground. In spite of the dangers of being discovered by the NKVD, the forerunner of the KGB, Priests held clandestine services in the woods or in people's apartments. The church continued to exist in this way until 1989. The Ukrainian Autocephalous Orthodox Church, which was destroyed by Stalin in 1928, continued to exist in exile. In the post-Stalin thaw of the 60s, a new generation of writers, artists, and other intellectuals emerged. At first, their movement called for cultural and creative freedom, but soon their activities moved from poetry readings to politics. A group formed to monitor Soviet compliance with the Helsinki Human Rights Accords. In Ukraine, they became known as the 60 years. In the 70s, Brezhnev and his KGB responded with wholesale arrests. The secret trials, reminiscent of the Stalin days, were a sham. Prisons and hard labor camps of the Gulag became filled with a new breed of political prisoner. These were the children of communism, whose crime was to demand the constitutionally guaranteed rights of the individual. The dissidents continued their protests from within the prisons. Those on the outside who dared to defend them also were arrested, tried, and sentenced. But new members stepped in to take up the fight. Bootleg literature exposing the abuses of the Soviet judicial system became the symbol of the growing movement of political dissent. Reports of the dissidents' refusal to renounce their political views in the face of tortures and beatings spread like wildfire among the populace. 
Instead of destroying this generation of intellectuals, the communist authorities were actually creating the heroes that would inspire the Ukrainian people to embark on their third journey to independence. Vyacheslav Chornovil, journalist, sent to cover some of the early trials, Chornovil was outraged by what he saw. His expose on the illegal and cynical manipulation of the judicial system by the communist authorities was labeled illegal anti-Soviet propaganda. Chornovil was sentenced under Article 62I of the Criminal Code to a cumulative 16 years hard labor. Bodan Horan, art historian, and his brother, Mihailo, industrial psychologist, arrested for reading and passing to colleagues four books published in the West, sentenced under Article 62I to 12 and 14 years hard labor. Lev Lukianenko, jurist, arrested for raising the question of Ukraine's right to secede from the USSR as is guaranteed by the Soviet Constitution. Death sentence, commuted to 27 years, hard labor. And there were many, many more. Ukrainians comprised 60 to 70 percent of the political prisoners in the camps, although Ukrainians accounted for less than 20 percent of the general Soviet population. When Mikhail Gorbachev came to power in 1985, the Soviet Union was a closed totalitarian state ruled by the military-industrial complex. By releasing thousands of these political prisoners, Gorbachev hoped to infuse the stagnant Soviet society with new blood and fresh ideas. His slogan was democratization, but what the people really wanted was democracy. Many of the 60ers did not survive the gulag, but those that did became the leaders of a fledgling democratic and nationalist movement. In September 1989, 1,100 delegates from every strata of Ukrainian society gathered in Kyiv. Their aim was to implement Gorbachev's perestroika in Ukraine. They called their grassroots movement RUP. The word means action, noise, excitement. From a swap meet of opposition politics, RUK formed a formidable alliance of advocacy groups from all walks of Soviet life. Just three months after its founding Congress, RUK mobilized the population of Ukraine into a living chain that stretched from Lviv to Kyiv, symbolically linking the two centers of Ukraine. The Living Chain commemorated the 71st anniversary of the unification of East and West under the Ukrainian National Republic of 1919. For 500 miles, people braved the cold of winter to support Ruk and its goal of rebuilding the country. Rook's call was quickly taken up by the hundreds of pop and rock groups that mushroomed in the era of Glasnost. Their music, originally targeted at the disillusioned Soviet youth, crossed all generation gaps and became the medium for Rook's message. At first, Rook supported Gorbachev's perestroika, but his reforms were erratic and peaceful. When Gorbachev's politics started a dangerous shift toward the conservative element, Ruk determined the only road to Ukraine's survival as a nation was through political and economic independence. With the notion of independence came a resurgence of national pride. The long band trident and blue and yellow flag enjoyed a spectacular comeback, particularly in western Ukraine where national consciousness had developed deep roots. Ironically, it was the communist-controlled police and media that galvanized the support for Ruch in western Ukraine. In 1990, when an ACE TV reporter rushed back to his Lviv studio with videotape of police violently breaking up pro-democracy demonstrations, his party bosses refused to put it on the air. Sympathetic engineers, knowing that the bosses never actually watched the predictable party-line programming, snuck it in and they kept sneaking it in. By the time the bosses realized what was going on, the public was demanding more coverage of pro-democracy activities. Membership in Ruk swelled. Soon, Lviv and Western Ukraine became Ruk's stronghold. 
Many of the former political prisoners who survived the Gulag, including Chornovil, Horan, and Lukianenko, ran on the Rook platform in the elections of March 4, 1990. This was the Super Bowl Sunday of Soviet Slavic politics, with over one million seats at stake in the first free elections to local, county, and republic governments. The Communist Party apparat, renowned masters of electoral fraud, manipulated the election procedures. And yet, in spite of vast electoral irregularities, the Democratic opposition secured 20% of electoral seats union-wide. Lviv city and county governments switched from communist to democratic overnight. The first act by the new Democrats was to replace the Soviet Republic flag with a blue and yellow national flag at city hall and all public buildings. The new Democrats now controlled city hall, but communist hardliners still controlled all major city services, including the media. This made for interesting local politics. When the Democrats wanted live television coverage of the new council's historic first session, the communist station managers pleaded poverty. Within a week, the citizens of Lviv raised two and a half million rubles. The station now covers all the sessions, gavel to gavel. Then there was the case of the Red Army Colonel General who arrived from Moscow announcing the installation of a satellite tracking station near Lviv. Wait a minute, says the council, where's your required environmental impact study? Leadership of the Lviv regional government passed into the hands of former political prisoner Vyacheslav Chernovil, who also became a leader of the democratic opposition in Ukraine's parliament. As a journalist in the 60s, he exposed the abuses of the Soviet judicial system. As chairman of the Lviv regional government, he is the leader of Ukraine's most politically aggressive district. In 1987, the concept of Ukrainian independence was discussed in hushed whispers throughout Ukraine, but it was discussed openly at the Klumba, a popular pedestrian mall in the heart of Lviv. By 1990, independence was considered an inevitable political reality and debate here moved on to what should be the order of business once independence is secured. Klumba refers to a communal wheat thrashing floor, which was also the place of animated debate and exchange of political, economic, and cultural ideas. There's no wheat at this Klumba, but information continues to be the name of the game. A myriad of political and environmental newspapers can be purchased here. When Gorbachev unleashed Glasnost, the press and media switched from being Communist Party cheerleader to party watchdog exposing high-level corruption and the privileged lifestyle of party hierarchs. With their chauffeur-driven limousines, fancy apartments, country dachas, special hospitals, and special well-stocked stores, while long lines and empty shelves were a fact of life for the average Soviet citizen. The press also exposed the dark side of Soviet history. Thousands of mass graves of the victims of Stalin's repression were unearthed, evidence of the heinous crimes and murder committed in the name of communism. The official name of Lviv's Klumba is Lenin's Prospect. Diehard communists still came to pay their respects at Lenin's monument, but the overwhelming majority of Western Ukrainians paid their respects instead to the crane that would take Lenin away. In October 1990, Lviv gave Vladimir Ilyich his eviction papers. With its flag raising and linen bashing, Lviv leads the country in iconoclasm. But its boldest action by far has been the legalization of the Catholic Church. For centuries, most Ukrainians have belonged to the Orthodox Church. In the late 1500s, a group of Ukrainian bishops, clergy, and faithful joined a union with Rome establishing the Ukrainian Catholic Church. Glasnost eased restrictions on religion, but it also stirred age-old religious rivalries. Churches were reopened, restored, and returned to the faithful. But when Ukrainian Catholics emerged from the underground to reclaim their church property that had been confiscated by Stalin, they faced a bitter struggle with the Russian Orthodox. To some, St. George Cathedral represents the finest example of Ukrainian Baroque architecture, but this is the main cathedral for the Ukrainian Catholic Church, and the conflict over its possession has been the fiercest. 
When the Lviv regional government officially returned the cathedral to the Catholics, the Russian Orthodox refused to give it up. The two groups clashed, prompting a temporary lockup of the church. Masses continued to be held at a makeshift altar, while the communist-dominated parliament in Kyiv deliberated who had the right to administer local churches. In the end, the regional government's decision was upheld. While the new religious freedoms have stirred conflict among older worshippers, the younger generation is coming to the church in droves. Some come out of curiosity, some come to see the ornate ritual, others come to find a long-denied spiritual life. The newly opened churches can barely keep up with the demand for religious wedding services and baptisms for babies and adults alike. Synagogues are also being reopened and restored. Pomyat is the extremist organization of Russian nationalists whose anti-Semitic newspapers are openly sold in Moscow streets. But Pomyat and all anti-Semitic activities are officially banned in Ukraine. The Shevchenko Language Society, in association with Ruk, has actively lobbied for the opening of Hebrew language schools and has served as a catalyst for the creation of the Shalom Aleichem Society, whose purpose is the revival of Jewish culture in Ukraine. For decades, the Ukrainian parliament was a textbook example of a rubber-stamped Congress, but when the new parliament convened, the democratic opposition turned the normally sedate assembly hall into a lively political bazaar. The televised parliamentary sessions became the blockbuster hit of the summer. For a nation that had never really seen political debate, this was a festival of free expression. In the official, albeit questionable, results of the March elections, Ruk and the Democratic opposition secured only 25 percent of the 450 electoral seats. 239 were hardline communist, leaving about 100 potential swing votes. The first confrontation came over the nomination of Vladimir Ivashko for chairman of parliament. Ivashko was the Communist Party chief in Ukraine. The Democrats charged conflict of interest. They demanded that Ivashko either resign as party chief or withdraw his nomination. Begrudgingly, Ivashko resigned and was subsequently confirmed as chairman of parliament. For the democratic minority, this was quite a heady victory and encouraged them to present their draft of Ukraine's Declaration of Independence. The word independence, suggesting secession from the Soviet Union, traumatized the communists. They demanded it be changed to sovereignty, meaning autonomy within the USSR. As the debate raged on, the 28th Communist Party Congress convened in Moscow. Mikhail Gorbachev was attacked from both sides. The hardliners blamed him for losing Eastern Europe and bringing the Soviet Union to the brink of chaos, while radical reformers led by Boris Yeltsin blamed him for the inadequate reforms that did nothing but further exacerbate the economic crisis. Boris Yeltsin's dramatic resignation from the party proved that the once invincible institution of power was riddled with inner conflict. For a while, it looked like Gorbachev was going to sink. He summoned his old allies, including Volodymyr Ivashko, who grabbed the next plane to Moscow. In Kyiv, both communists and democrats were shocked that Ivashko would desert the Ukrainian parliament while it was embroiled in a heated debate on the sovereignty issue. Ivashko's desertion further splintered the already discombobulated communist majority. The protest of constituents who gathered outside the parliament building grew more and more vocal. Ivashko proved the Democrats' earlier charges that he would not be a suitable candidate for presidency because he would always place the needs of the Communist Party above those of the Ukrainian state. In Moscow, Gorbachev successfully weathered his political storm. On the day he was re-elected as the Communist Party chief, Volodymyr Ivashko resigned as chairman of the Ukrainian parliament. The very next day, Gorbachev announced his number two man in the Communist Party. It was Volodymyr Ivashko. This added insult to injury. The Ivashko debacle left the communist majority leaderless and embittered while the Democrats gelled into what the people nicknamed the Dim Bloc, which took full advantage of the chaos within the communist ranks and intensified their sovereignty efforts. On July 16, 1990, with its overwhelming communist majority, 
Ukraine's parliament adopted the Declaration of Sovereignty with a vote of 355 for, with only four against, and 92 abstentions. The declaration states, Ukraine's permanent neutrality with the right of enforceable borders, that Ukraine becomes a nuclear-free state, Ukraine has a right to establish national armed forces and conduct its own foreign affairs. Ukraine takes authority over the factories, mines, and farms on its territory. Ukraine has the right to establish an independent banking system, issue its own currency, and control its own budget. Ukraine has the right to enter into capital ventures with other republics, bypassing the central government. Ukraine demands its share of the central government's gold, diamond, and foreign exchange holdings. Although the Declaration of Sovereignty was a far cry from what the Democrats wanted, it laid the groundwork for Ukraine's future move toward independence. Ukraine's first Declaration of Independence under the Ukrainian National Republic was read from this balcony. 71 years later, the people gathered at the same site to welcome their new heroes, the deputies of the Democratic opposition. Each deputy received an ovation, particularly the brothers Horan. Both deputies were from the Lviv district, both political prisoners and members of the 60 years group of dissidents. Bodan Horan addressed his constituents not as dear comrades, but as ladies and gentlemen. Україні аж поки спромогла вона по волі Божій проголосити 16 липня 1990 року днем незалежності, який буде відзначатись щорічно, і сьогодні ми відзначаємо його у Львові вперше. Перемога належить усім представникам демократичних сил і ці квіти усім членам Народної Ради, які доклали максимум зусиль, щоб декларація була прийнята такою, як ви її читали. Слава їм! The people of Kyiv celebrated the declaration by raising the national flag at an honorary mass at City Hall. On very short notice, a surprisingly large crowd gathered at St. Sophia Cathedral to participate in the blessing of the city's new flag. As drops of holy water hit the fabric of the flag, the emotional crowd broke into chants of Slava. The word can best be translated as a combination of victory, glory and honor. Anyone who could struggled to hold on to the edge of the flag as it was ceremoniously carried down Volodymyr Street. At the forefront, in the most honorary position, were young men dressed as Zaporizhian Cossacks who led the flag and the people through the streets of Kyiv. The crowd swelled as the flag made its way down to Khrushchev Boulevard and City Hall. En route, rumors spread that the actual proclamation of National Flag Day never took place, that some communist presidium members of the city council did not want this flag to go up, but neither did they want to incur the wrath of the people. They walked out of the presidium meeting, hoping that without a quorum, somehow this event would just go away. Additionally, a strike of the mass transit system had been called that day. It was unclear who called the strike, but if the communists wanted to prevent the masses from arriving at City Hall, they failed. Paschatik was packed solid from City Hall all the way to the Bessarabian market. The deputy mayor of Kyiv confirmed the rumors. 
що частина членів президії, за яких ви в тому, мабуть, числі голосували, просто втекла з нашого засідання. Вони... Jeers and whistles condemning the Communist Party turned to chants for independence. Meanwhile, staffers of the Democratic Councilmen were out combing the streets searching for the wayward Communist Presidium members. Then came the announcement two councilmen had been found and were encouraged to return to City Hall for the final vote. Although they voted against the proclamation, as expected, a quorum was secured and the proclamation was adopted. generation, this flag and the trident represent the fortitude of the Ukrainian spirit and its survival through wars and oppression. To the students, these are also the symbols of anger and frustration. The students created the trident hand sign as a condemnation of what they have inherited from the communists. Economic stagnation, ideological emptiness, Chernobyl, a staggering cleanup of the environment. It is this generation that will pay the price for the failed experiment called communism. The entrance to City Hall is flanked by two flag masks. Perhaps it was a case of reflexive paranoia when everyone turned to cast at least one glance at the Soviet Republic flag, which was flying from the other mast. Four months earlier, the Baltics announced their plans to secede from the Soviet Union. By summer, the infectious fever of independence was also spreading throughout Ukraine. The political situation continued to escalate. That October, the university students staged a protest demanding the resignation of Ukraine's communist anti-reform leaders. The communists hardly took them seriously. A tent city formed at the base of Kyiv's Lenin Monument. Wearing white headbands, identifying them as hunger strikers, the students voiced their fears for the future of Ukraine. <laughs> At first, senior citizens who had trouble surviving on a fixed income and the mothers of soldiers forced to fight in other Soviet republics joined the students, then the factory workers. But within a week, the ranks of student supporters grew from several hundred to several hundred thousand. Now the communists had cause for concern. When the students made their way toward the heavily guarded parliament building, Kyiv's entire militia was mobilized. In a well-executed maneuver, the students broke through the four-man-deep human barricade surrounding the parliament building and immediately dropped to the ground. The second wave of students was followed by a third and a fourth. In less than a minute, an army of student strikers and their supporters were camped in front of Ukraine's parliament building. They could hardly be ignored now. The strike leaders refused to meet with the communist leadership in camera and forced them to negotiate in public over the public address system. Just 17 days after the start of the hunger strike, the students not only won the right to address Ukraine's parliament and via television the entire nation, but also succeeded in securing the resignation of Ukraine's prime minister, a communist hardliner, and several other high-ranking communist officials. But the summer of 1990, so full of hope and promise, gave way to a winter of pessimism and paralysis. 
The violent crackdown in Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia was a sobering reminder of the high cost of secession politics in the Soviet Union. Fifteen unarmed civilians were killed. 186 people were injured. Gorbachev waited 36 hours before making a statement, and when he did, he blamed the Lithuanians. By never actually condemning the violence, he sanctioned it, even promoting one of the responsible ministers. In Moscow, Soviet citizens of all the republics gathered to protest the crackdown in the Baltics. They sensed that if democracy was not safe there, it would certainly not be safe in their own hometowns. In the ensuing months, Gorbachev tried to pressure the republics into signing his federation treaty, but the tide was turning. The republics, particularly Ukraine, wanted the final say in their own governments. They wanted much less power in the center. The two largest republics, Russia and Ukraine, were already acting like independent states. Leonid Krauchuk, Ukraine's interim president, signed bilateral trade agreements with Yeltsin's Russia, bypassing Gorbachev. More and more, the central government's role in republic politics was fading. In December, Eduard Shevardnadze resigned as foreign minister. In August, it was Alexander Yakovlev, another member of Gorbachev's inner circle. Yakovlev's warnings of a coup were realized one week later. Although the coup was short-lived, it sealed the fate of the Soviet Union. On August 24th, an anxious silence fell over the sea of Ukrainians who came to witness as the parliament deliberated the future of Ukraine and the Soviet Union. They were simple words, barely enough to fill one page, but they composed Ukraine's act of independence and carried the power to shatter the Soviet Union. It was put to a vote. These were the most suspenseful 10 seconds for Ukraine, for its people, for Gorbachev, for Yeltsin. The results were a landslide victory with 346 for independence, one against, and this time only 16 abstentions. With this vote, Ukraine completed its third journey to independence, and in so doing, hastened the domino effect among the other republics that would quickly lead to the complete disintegration of the Soviet Empire. The surprising lack of opposition to Ukrainian independence from the communist majority in Ukraine's parliament indicated that perhaps those who had secretly supported the coup were now seeking refuge in Ukrainian nationalism from the anti-communist fervor sweeping the country. Я прошу, щоб саме цей прапор був встановлений у нашому залі. І ще я пропоную, щоб так можна до того, як ми приймемо вже рішення в Конституції про національну символіку, просто як національний прапор, наш прапор був піднятий над куполом Верховної Ради. Дякую за увагу. Над шановні товариші, пропозиція зводиться до того, що мова йде про пам'ятний прапор, який був на нашому танкові, ну не на нашому, на якому, я не знаю. Екіпаж український, екіпаж. Екіпаж. And so it was. The tattered flag was ceremoniously brought into the assembly hall and handed to Leonid Krauchuk, chairman of Ukraine's parliament. The series of events surrounding the failed coup propelled Krochuk into the spotlight. This politician is Ukraine's greatest political anomaly. As the longtime Communist Party ideology chief, he fervently led the fight against Ruch and the nationalists, but when the tide changed, Krochuk turned political chameleon and cast his lot with them. Krochuk's welcoming address to President Bush surprised everyone. It was spoken in Ukrainian, not Russian. 
Kravchuk was instrumental in getting the Declaration of Independence adopted, perhaps to distract from the implication that he himself had waited too long to condemn the coup and resign from the Communist Party. Some say that behind the hard shell of a communist beats the heart of a flaming nationalist. Others say Kravchuk is a silver-tongued orator who can steal a chicken from a farmer and still remain friends with the farmer. In either case, Krauchuk is a savvy political strategist that few would bet against. In the summer of 1990, Ukrainians raised their national flag at City Hall. In the summer of 1991, the national flag would replace the republic flag on the premier mast of the country, over the glass dome of the parliament building. In the battle of two opposing ideologies, communism was out, national democracy was in. But old habits die hard. When the national flag was raised, the republic flag was lurking behind it. These communist shenanigans angered the people. They demanded one flag only. It may very well have turned into the first ugly incident in Ukraine, but a Democratic deputy appeased the crowd and urged them to take another look at the mast. For the first time, Ukrainians could see the symbol of their long-suppressed national identity fly over the seat of their government. It was a national catharsis. A skittish Boris Yeltsin sent his vice president to Kyiv to create a hasty alliance with Ukraine, and yet he issued a terse statement claiming Russia's right to redefine Ukraine's borders should it choose to secede. Yeltsin's theory was that borders within the former Soviet Union have always been symbolic, and that now real borders need to be defined. However, Ukraine's current borders are internationally recognized by the United Nations. Ukraine became a charter member of the UN in 1945 as part of a deal President Roosevelt made with Stalin to get the Soviets to go along with the creation of the UN. Some people have urged the United States to choose between supporting President Gorbachev and supporting independence-minded leaders throughout the USSR. I consider this a false choice. But on December 1st, that choice was very real for the 52 million citizens of Ukraine who were asked to vote either yes or no to the referendum question, do you support the Parliament's Declaration of Independence of August 24th? To prove how emphatically yes their yes votes were, millions of Ukrainians rushed to the polling stations the minute they opened. Some 30 percent of the votes were cast within the first hour. The voter turnout was 84.2 percent, of whom 90.3 percent voted for independence. When Ukrainians took to the polls, they also elected Leonid Kravchuk as their first president. After the euphoria of Independence Day subsides, this new European nation must start another and even more difficult journey. Real independence may take decades to establish. Ukraine's special predicament is that it must simultaneously build a modern state and a democratic market-based society. It must create and educate a new political bureaucracy that will now make the myriad of decisions that for seven decades have been made in Moscow. It must disarm a staggering nuclear arsenal. It must continue to monitor the still unfolding Chernobyl catastrophe and pioneer the elimination of nuclear power on its territory. After centuries of failed attempts to attain lasting self-government, a goal which has eluded them throughout their historical experience, today's Ukrainians are filled with the hope that this time, independence will be permanent, that someday soon, their bread and steel republic will prosper and stand proud as a new democracy in the family of nations. <laughs>